Hello! Today we're going to talk about a rough design of wideband millimeter wave beamforming systems. My name is Giorgia Zucchelli and a product manager at MathWorks for the RF and mixed signal area. I've been in this role for more than 10 years, so that there is a good chance that we already talked in the past, or we might have met in person at conferences such as the European Microwave Week or IMS. So why are we talking about millimeter wave systems? Why is millimeter wave even a thing today? Well, uh, communication systems uh, are um, driven to provide higher and higher data rates. And one way to do that is to use signals with larger bandwidth. And one way to support larger bandwidth is to move the center frequencies uh, to higher frequencies in the millimeter wave range, in the double digit gigahertz range. We see this uh, with the FR2 bandwidth provided by 5G and even more extreme, the trends for 6G. We see this in satellite communication systems where there is an explosion and using complex modulations such as uh, DVB-S2X uh, or 5G for non-terrestrial application. And we also see this for wireless localization uh, systems that uh, also require the wider bandwidth for improving accuracy uh, for providing location. The design of a millimeter wave system is complex. So first of all, uh, propagation losses are higher, which means that you need to pack more and more antenna close together. You need to develop beamforming algorithms that compensate for coupling effects. The behavior of the UF system is not flat across uh, the signal bandwidth with signals that have bandwidth exceeding 100 megahertz easily, 400 megahertz, one gigahertz and more. So you need to develop uh, equalization, phase compensation, linearization algorithms. And in the RF domain, you always test the system using CW or single tone. And this is not representative of the behavior of your system when it uses large signal bandwidth. This means that you need other metrics such as EVM, ACLR, and you need to, uh, to, you need to measure these metrics in presence, for example, of different scenarios such as interfering signals for receiver or when your system is really large with thousands of antennas. And this adds complexity to complexity. As a millimeter wave system designer, you need to answer many questions. How many antenna elements do you need? What type? What spacing? Is coupling affecting the system performance? How to test and design informing algorithm? What is the impact of dispersion? How to design and test equalization algorithms? What happens if a component fail or if it's not compliant to the specification? Uh, what about interfering signals and how do you scale up? In this presentation, we will answer all these questions and we will see how model-based design can help answering them. We will start with uh, the design of a single chain. This is our baseline. This is where we will start from and the array design. Then we will integrate them together into a larger system, uh, for example, with eight antennas and eight chains. And then from there, we will scale up to a thousand antennas, actually 1,024. So if you want to see how to simulate a full RF system with 1,024 antennas, stay with me. So we're going to see step by step the entire process, starting from a single chain and increasing progressively the complexity of our model. We will use models throughout our entire design cycle. So let's get started. And this is going to be our first step. So Every single RF design that I know of starts with uh, essentially a budget analysis that normally is done with spreadsheets. Uh, in this case, we use a, a, a transmitter as an example made of five components, a filter, an amplifier, a modulator, a power amplifier, and uh, finally the antenna. It's a fairly straightforward system, but is representative of many architectures. For each of the components, we provide its specifications, uh, like its S parameters, as well as uh, nonlinear characteristics in terms of output referred IP3, noise figure, phase noise, as well as the impedances. So how do you do this in MATLAB? We use the RF Budget Analyzer app. There are many videos on the MathWorx website that will show this. In this case, we use a session that I previously created just uh, to speed up the process. Here you see the five components that we described before. It uh, excited uh, the input frequency of 4 GHz with an input power of minus 30 dBm and a signal bandwidth of 100 MHz. 
For the amplifier, we actually use the S parameters as well as the output referred IP3 at 4 gigahertz. We see here the um, you know, linear characteristics. This is a component coming from Corvo. It's just an example. For the modulator, we set uh, the LO center frequency at 23 gigahertz. So we do an up conversion from 4 gigahertz plus 23 gigahertz. We land at 27 gigahertz. Here you see the budget at every step of the chain. Um, so you see how each of the components uh, modifies the budget in terms of power, gain, noise figure, and output area. Uh, the last component of our chain is the antenna. We designed this antenna using the antenna toolbox. So in this case, again, I load a, a design that I already did of a circular patch antenna. Uh, this is an interesting antenna for many point of view. Uh, it's just in free space for simplicity, but I could have mounted it on a dielectric. Um, here on the left, you see the uh, geometric characteristics of the antenna. We can compute its impedance using the method of moments, full wave electromagnetic analysis, the S parameters, the given indication of the bandwidth, as well as the 3D far field radiation pattern. We see that the antenna is on, um, uh, on the X axis. It has a directivity of 9.7 dBi pointing a 90 degree of azimuth along the bore side. And then we can update our element in the budget and uh, it gets uh, updated, including the directivity of the antenna as well as the final EIRP. We can analyze the chain using harmonic balance and S parameters. We can plot the S parameters across each of the stage of our chain. Uh, as well, we can use, a, like I was saying, a harmonic balance to look at the nonlinear characteristics of the chain. We are now going to export our uh, budget to a simulation model. This is a simulink model that we can simulate in the time domain. For each of the components, you can see that we have exactly the same parameters that we specified in the budget and the chain gets automatically created. The simulation uses a harmonic balance and circuit envelope in the background to compute the results. When we run the simulation, we also see that the output of the antenna is reported in both vertical and horizontal polarization components. And we can now compare it with our budget and see uh, that uh, with the simulation, we land exactly at the same place where we are expected. Now we move from a single antenna to an array. And uh, we will do a lot of uh, studies of what coupling means with in, the, in the context of antenna design. So we go from one to eight circular patch antennas. So we go back to our uh, a patch antenna that we just designed to the session in the antenna designer app. We can verify that the pattern, we can also look at the azimuthal cut of the pattern with the antenna metrics. This is exactly what we just used in our budget. We can also verify the impedance. Uh, we are now going to uh, export the pattern, um, but rather than exporting it as a measurement, we are going to export it as a script. This allows you to repeat the antenna design and analysis many, many times. Uh, most MATLAB apps allows you to generate a script. We are going to modify the script to save the pattern of the antenna in the variable P. P is a, a MATLAB workspace variable that uh, contains the, far, the magnitude of the far field pattern of our antenna. It's a matrix of 37 by 73 elements representing the pattern of the circular patch at 5 degrees of resolution in angle. We are now going to open the sensor array analyzer. From here, we are going to import our pattern. This could have been created with the antenna toolbox, or it could have been generated by other third-party electromagnetic software. We import our pattern that has been defined at um, with a resolution of five degrees, we use the variable P that we just created, and for the phase, we just use zeros in this case. Uh, the antenna was designed at 27 gigahertz, that is the output frequency of our transmitter, and this will determine the spacing in between the antenna elements. After we import the antenna, we start with the design of the array. So we design an eight element array spaced by half lambda. We align the elements along the X direction, as we have seen, so that our array normal is along the Y direction of or 90 degrees along the azimuth uh, direction. Once the array is designed, we can compute the far field radiation pattern using pattern superposition of the isolated element. 
is a little bit jigsaw because of the resolution of five degrees. We can inspect the pattern. We can also look at the azimuthal cut to verify that it's pointing at 90 degrees. From here, we measure the directivity at 90 degrees along the azimuth direction, and we see that we went from 9.7 to 16.3 dBi using eight element. Let's say that we are happy with that. What's next? We are now gonna verify two things. First of all, what is half lambda? Uh, in this case, half lambda is the light speed divided by the operating frequency divided by two, so 5.6 millimeters. Now we are gonna use the antenna array designer and we're gonna verify that this spacing is possible and we're gonna verify that the pattern what we saw with, uh, with the sensor array analyzer computed with pattern superposition is actually uh, accurate and representative of the full wave analysis of the antenna. I open the antenna array designer and um, I, first of all, I see that I have my eight circular patches and that I cannot have a spacing of 5.6 millimeters because the antennas would touch. So I need a larger spacing of 6.4 millimeters. Second, I verify my far field pattern and I can see that the directivity is 16.3 dBi, close enough to what we just obtained with the sensor array analyzer. But the pattern, it looks, uh, looks very similar on the main lobe, but on the side lobes is slightly different. This is due to the effects of coupling on, between the antenna elements. We also computed the S parameters of the array. As we have eight elements, we have eight by eight, 64 S parameters, representing the impedance, the bandwidth of each of the antenna elements, as well as the coupling. So now we will use this information to verify that our antenna array analyzed with pattern superposition provides consistent results. And also we will use the S parameters to model the near field coupling of the antenna elements. So we go back to our sensor array analyzer session and we change the spacing in between the antenna elements from half lambda to 6.4 millimeters. We see that the directivity is slightly different. But more importantly, because now we are at more than half lambda, we will have grating lobes. And remember, grating lobes cannot be minimized with tapering. So, so far we saw the effects of coupling of going from one antenna to eight antennas. Now we're gonna see the overall system performance by integrating this eight antenna de element design in with our transmitters. So this is the same design that we just generated from the budget app. Uh, remember the EIRP of 25 dBm along the horizontal position. I created a model for convenience where I copied this chain eight times. Its chain is independent, so there is no coupling. We just sum up the power at the output. And what we see is that we land at the output power of approximately 43 dBm. This is the EIRP that you would obtain if you would do a simple static analysis using spreadsheet. Now we modify the design to use the S parameters of our array that we just computed with full wave electromagnetic analysis. These S parameters now couples the eight antennas and models the near field coupling. For the pattern, we use pattern superposition. We use again our variable P representing the pattern of our patch, eight elements spaced by 6.4 millimeters along the X direction. And we can verify again that this uh, provides the same pattern that we just analyzed with the sensor array analyzer. So we use pattern superposition of the isolated element to compute the array K and its directivity. So we take into account the near field coupling, but not far field coupling. We run the simulation and we land at the total EIRP that is approximately 40.3 dBm. In our last model, we use the antenna block. The antenna block allows you to model both the impedance of the antenna array as well as the near the far field coupling. So we use the object um, patch eight array. Uh, this is our array of eight circular patch antennas, the same array that we just designed with an antenna array designer with antenna toolbox. Uh, the antenna block does all the work for us to take into account both near and far field coupling. And this really gives us um, the ultimate uh, measure of what is the impact of coupling. 
We run the simulation and we land, end up with a EIRP of 41.5 dBm. So you can compare now what is the effect of near field coupling and compared with no coupling at all. This gives you an understanding of where the coupling is coming from. Also remember, each antenna behaves different, differently. If you would have done this with dipoles, dipoles don't really couple, so we wouldn't have seen such big difference. And 3 dB is half the power. So coupling is definitely something that you need to take into account in your system performance. Now we're going to extend the models to include beamforming algorithms, and we are going to see the impact of non-idealities introduced by the RF transmitter on the beamforming algorithms. We go back to our sensor array analyzer session. This is where we landed before with our array pointing at 90 degrees with a directivity of 16.9 dBi. We now steer the beam at 30 degrees from the bore side. This will allow us to compare um, the um, amplitude and phase excitation to steer the beam. From here, we are going to uh, generate a script again, like we did before, and we will get something similar to this, where we use our an eight element ULA with our custom antenna element with our pattern P, and we can compute the phase shifts. So the variable phase shifts now includes the eight phase shifts that are required to steer the beam at 30 degrees from bore side, three minus 100 and so forth. Now we go back to our model that we just created, and we are going to modify the model to include the phase shifters. And each of the phase shifters use the phase shifts to steer the beam. Now we run the simulation, and we end up with an EARP of approximately 39 dBm, 39.6. Um, we also modified the model to sense the voltage excitation at the terminal of each antenna. So these output ports probe the complex excitation at 27 gigahertz that each antenna receives, and we save it into the variable workspace called V out. Why is this useful or interesting? Because now we can use the variable V out as an excitation in amplitude and phase to our antenna array. This is the antenna array that we analyzed using full wave electromagnetic analysis. In other words, this allows us to look how the pattern of the array looks like instantaneously depending on your excitation. We can see the 2D as well as the 3D pattern as well as the antenna matrix. This is a very important step because now we can analyze the effect of the entire RF transceiver chain in terms of non-idealities on the pattern itself of our array. So let's see what I mean. We can, for example, change the output impedance of our amplifier. We can randomize it uh, with a variable to be between 25 and 75 ohms. You can see here we modify our model so that the output impedance of the amplifier is defined by a random variable with the real part between 25 and 75 ohms and an imaginary part between minus 10 and plus 10 ohms. Now we run the simulation multiple times. So you see it here, we run it three times and three times we got three very different patterns. Similarly, we can change the input or the low center frequencies. Uh, the a low frequency in this case is 23 gigahertz. The input frequency is 4 gigahertz. These are variables that are defined in the workspace. We can change them. This means that our antenna array that was designed to operate at 27 gigahertz will be excited at 27.5 or 28 gigahertz. And this will lead to deformation to the pattern itself due to mostly dispersion. We can also change the input power of our chain and uh, drive the transmitter into saturation. So here you see how satu we saturated the device, uh, the transmitter, so the output power is not what we would expect, but is lower. And we can see the effects of non-idealities on our pattern. Uh, we can verify uh, again at each step that the simulation and that the budget analysis provide consistent results, uh, even in uh, saturation. And by the way, if you 
if you looked at the budget, you could see how we are here comparing freeze results with the harmonic balance results. And harmonic balance is a nonlinear analysis, so we see the impact of saturation on the budget itself. Again, you see how at every step I went back to my budget and compared with simulation. So far, we fed each individual chain separately. This is not realistic. In reality, we will have one uh, input signal and we will have a feeding network. In this case, we modified the design to have a Wilkinson splitter as a placeholder to the network. And we're going to uh, measure here the EIRP that is approximately 38, uh, 39 dBm. The Wilkinson introduces uh, as a flat behavior in frequency, so it's constant in frequency. It, it includes a phase rotation and an attenuation of 9 dB. Now we're going to design a Wilkinson splitter on a PCB using the RF PCB toolbox. So we design the Wilkinson splitter, we change the spacing in between the two arms so that we can cascade multiple chains and create a network that splits the input signal to eight outputs. Uh, so this is our uh, Wilkinson splitter that we just designed, we see with seven lines of MATLAB code, as well as we can inspect its S parameters. Because we changed arbitrarily the spacing between the arms, the S parameters don't look great. As you can see, there is a little bit of tapering and is not well matched. But for the time being, we go with what we obtained, just for convenience. We're going to design a second Wilkinson splitter. And we can again inspect its S parameters. And then we are going to cascade the first Wilkinson splitter with two instances of the second Wilkinson splitter that we just divided. So you see, again, we use PCB cascade. Last but not least, we are going to design a third stage of the Wilkinson splitter again, inspect these as parameters. They are going to look a lot better in terms of bandwidth matching and losses. And then we are going to cascade the three structures to create an eight port divider. We compute the S parameters and we are going to use them in our model. So we go back to our model. We are going to remove our placeholder in place of an S parameter block. Uh, in the S parameter block, we are going to use the variable SW that we just computed using full wave analysis and the RF PCB toolbox. We're going to use SW into the S parameter block. This, S function, this, uh, this data could come from a file, could come from measurements, could come from a um, third party vendors. We are now going to reroute and reconnect the DS parameters to our network and again verify the simulation. At every step, we verify that the results are representative of the budget of our transmitter. So far, we sort of cheated. We used the simulation, but just to look at CW tones. Now we are going to use wideband modulated signals uh, to test our transmitter. We are going to start with a simple OFDM test bench, a simple baseband transmitter and receiver that uh, generates a random integer, uses a 64 quant modulation, uh, use an OFDM multiplexer with 1024 carriers, each with 120 kilohertz spacing for a total of 122 approximately megahertz of bandwidth. We are going to upsample this signal. Um, interpolated with a factor 4, so to look at the effect of spectral regrowth caused by the transmitter. And we are going to stream it through a baseband receiver that is going to downconvert it, equalize the gain, and uh, um, apply uh, coarse frequency offset, demodulate it, and the carrier synchronizer. And we are going to, of course, look at the constellation and measure the EVM. We modified our model uh, to include an OFDM test bench. If you look under the mask of this OFDM test bench, we have baseband signal generation that is composed by the blocks that we just saw in the slides. It also includes a power meter to measure the power and the spectrum analyzer to look at the spectrum of the, uh, at the input of the baseband receiver after the transmitter. We apply some delay, decimation, AGC, uh, coarse frequency uh, offset, phase offset um, calibration, we apply the demodulator, we talk about the equalizer in a second, and then we also have a carrier synchronizer and a constellation diagram. When we run the simulation, what we see is, uh, we, by the way, the input signal streams to the input of our transmitter. The output is probed from the 
uh, horizontal polarization of output of our antenna array block. We run the simulation, we look at the spectrum, as well as we look at the constellation. Uh, the spectrum is measured over a wider bandwidth because of the interpolation factor of 4. So we will see a 100 megahertz signal coming in. And uh, we will see um, the spectrum being updated, as well as the measure of the ACPR. Uh, on the right hand side, we see the constellation diagram. It takes a while for the AGC and the carrier synchronization to lock and to recover the baseband constellation. The constellation diagram gets updated uh, one, with one fourth of the speed of the spectrum analyzer because uh, the signal needs to be get decimated by a factor of four. And on the right hand side, you see the EVM measurement of the spectrum. You see that the constellation gets more compact and as the carrier synchronizer locks, it gets closer to our reference 64 quam constellation. By the way, in the diagram, in the model, you also see the EIRP converging towards our 38 dBm of um, EIRP that we were measuring before. And now we get um, an EVM of 1.5%. If you run the simulation longer, we will get a slightly better result due to the locking of the carrier synchronizer. Um, why did we need an uh, inequalization? Because um, our transmitter is affected by dispersion. So in the budget, we, when we looked at the S parameters, we could have looked at the phase of the S21, and we would have seen a constant group delay of 30 degrees phase rotation over the 100 megahertz of the signal. Uh, this means that at every carrier of the OFDM signal, a different phase shift is applied by the system. And the carrier synchronizer cannot compensate with this. We need an equalizer. So without the equalizer, we would have not been able to recover our constellation. So in this case, the equalizer just applies a phase compensation that is fixed and allows us to obtain a much better constellation. Things are fairly straightforward with a system that has just 100 megahertz bandwidth. We did the same experiment with the 400, gigahertz, 400 megahertz bandwidth and things get a lot more complicated. Um, so there is no such um, thing as a simple baseband uh, receiver when we are talking about signals with such large bandwidth and such large frequency of operation. In other words, uh, things get complicated. For this reason, in the remaining part of the presentation, I used a different baseband signal generation mechanism and different baseband uh, recovery. So what I used is 5G standard compliant signals and receiver. Here, I modified the model um, so that uh, the input and the output are not connected to anything. We just have an input port and an output port. And we will use this input port and output port to exchange waveforms to and from MATLAB. The input waveform gets up converted to 4 GHz and streamed through our transmitter. Uh, the antenna array probes the output waveform at 27 GHz. So this model has the name TX underscore 8 patch. Remember this because it's important. In a MATLAB workspace, I have a variable that is called RFTX. RFTX is an RF system that wraps our simulating model, TX8 patch, uh, with a given input frequency, output frequency, and sample time of execution. Now I can use the RF system, RF underscore TX, to uh, simulate our uh, transmitter as part of a MATLAB script or a MATLAB test bench. Um, to generate this test bench, I'm going to start from the wireless waveform generation. This is the fifth app that we see today. Um, I'm going to use and generate a new radio test model, a test signal, using FR2 bandwidth and test model 1.1 that is representative for testing receiver. 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing for a total bandwidth of 400 megahertz. I'm going to generate the waveform, look at the spectrum, at the resource grid, and then I'm going to export the waveform um, actually as a MATLAB script. 
From here, I'm going to use a Descript to generate the waveform and test our transmitter using the RF system that we just saw before. And actually, I'm going to use some of the functions that are shipping as examples, uh, not only to generate the waveform, but also to measure the EVM of our transmitter. So let's see it in action. I first uh, generate the waveform. It's good practice uh, to verify what is the spectrum of our waveform. We're going to measure, in this case, the ACLR using the spectrum analyzer because this is a reference waveform. The only contribution to the ACLR is due to the interpolation filter. We need to interpolate the waveform because we are testing a transmitter. We want to see the effects of the spectral regrowth. We're going to measure the EVM using, again, a helper function here. And we're expecting an EVM of zero. We get something really, really small, so it's good. We scale the input waveform, the 5G standard compliant waveform, TM1.1, to have an input power of minus 21 dBm. And then we are going to stream it through our RF system, RFTX, that is the wrapper around our Simulink model. Notice that the Simulink model gets executed with a sample time that is 1.9 GHz. What is it? It is essentially our 491 MHz divided by an interpolation factor of 4, or multiplied times 4. As we execute our RF system, we see in the background our simulating model gets executed, and as the simulation progresses, we see the EIRP being updated live. Uh, we run a waveform that is uh, one millisecond long through our transmitter. I'm loading here the results that we already pre-computed, just to save some time, and I'm going to measure the output power the peak to average power ratio. I'm going to look at the spectrum. You see the tapering here introduced by the Wilkinson splitter that was far from being ideal. We measure the ACLR on our spectrum. Uh, we see potential effects of spectral regrowth and we use standard compliant um, functions um, to measure the 3GPP EVM. So we can see that now the EVM went from 0 to 7.6% due to the uh, effects of the non-ideality of our transmitter. And keep in mind that, that this uh, receiver already includes uh, 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 automatic gain control and an equalizer. So this is what we have seen. Essentially, we have seen a way to include your RF models into MATLAB test benches and how to use standard compliant, sophisticated basement transmitter and receivers. We've seen this on a, an RF transmitter, but actually we also done the same experiment using a, a developing a model of an RF receiver. So you see here that the model is flipped. We have an antenna and a down conversion chain combining the signals. Why is this interesting? Because now that we have a model of an RF receiver and a, a 5G test bench that we can use to, start to measure AVM and ACLR, we can also test of quite exotic um, scenarios. For example, we can take into account interfering signals. So here we're going to see an example where we test our receiver with a 3GPP standard compliance signal coming in at 60 degrees of azimuth with an input power of minus 70 dBm. And then we are also going to test our receiver at, with another signal coming in, an interfering signal with 100 MHz bandwidth uh, with the same power, minus 70 dBm, but coming in at 19 GHz and at 40 degrees azimuth. I chose 90 degrees because is the image frequency. Is our low center frequency is 23 gigahertz. Our output IF frequency is 4 gigahertz. So 23 minus 4 makes 19. That's the image, and we will have a finite uh, image rejection filter. And we chose 40 degrees because, in a way, this is the worst case scenario. If we are steering the beam of our antenna at 60 degrees at 27 gigahertz, due to dispersion and beam squinting, the beam will be deformed at 19 gigahertz and will be pointing at towards 40 degrees. So this is an interesting experiment. Without interfering signal, the reference EVM of this receiver is 3.6 dBm, 3.6%. Now we will see when we run simulation that the DVM degrades. So we we'll use, again, the same test bench that we developed before, but we use a ref different test um, model at 3.1 that is more representative for testing a receiver. 
Again, we hop through the script quite rapidly. We look at the spectrum of the input signal at the um, a CPR peak to average power ratio as well as the EVM. This is all done on the reference input signal, so it's all going well. We scale down the input power to minus 70 dBm and then we stream it through our RF system, RF underscore RX. This is an RF system that points to our simulink model, RX underscore 8 patch underscore 8 out of band. The input frequency now is 27 gigahertz, the output frequency is now 4 gigahertz. Okay, made a mistake. Let's open up our RF system and let's look at our simulink model. The magic happened here in the antenna block. You see we have two center frequencies for two input signals and two different angles of arrival, 60 and 40 degrees of azimuth. Um, so the desired signal at 27 gigahertz get combined with the undesired signal at 19 gigahertz. We also have an image rejection filter, which has a really large bandwidth, 21 to 27 gigahertz. So we'll have finite rejection at 19 gigahertz. And I didn't talk about it, but we also have phase noise in our receiver, just like we had it in our transmitter. The second signal is an OFDM signal that gets uh, um, interfered with our 5G signal. We run the simulation and now we look at the output power that again we verified with the budget of the receiver. Uh, the ACPR is not really important for a receiver but we look at it in any case because it's always interesting to look what happens to the spectrum of the signal. And now we measure the standard compliant EVM using our 5G toolbox. And as you can see the um, EVM went from 3.6 to 4% due to the interfering signal. And we can see here in the spectrum how the 100 megahertz bandwidth interfering signals gets mixed right in the middle of our desired signal due to the finite rejection of the uh, image rejection filter. From here we can scale up to a thousand of antenna elements. This is really the juicy part of this presentation. How can we do that? To do that we need to raise the abstraction level of our model and we do this by breaking the model into three. First of all, we isolate where the coupling happens. In our model, the coupling happens at the input with our Wilkinson splitter, and our coupling happens in the antenna array. Um, then we provide a higher abstraction level model for the transmitter chain or each of the transmitter chains. And uh, we will run each of the transmitter chains using parallel simulation. What do I mean with raising the abstraction level of our chain? We're going to use five blocks and pretty much with these five blocks you can pretty much model almost any transmitter or any receiver. The first block models the input referred noise figure of our entire transmitter and this data comes from the budget analysis that we performed right at the beginning of this presentation. The last block models the output referred IP3 of our chain of uh, 44 dBm. And again, this number comes from the budget analysis that we performed right at the beginning of the simulation. We also have an S-parameter block that models the dispersion of the phase and frequency dependency across the entire chain by cascading all the components that have frequency dependency. We model the phase noise of our um, modulator and we explicitly model the phase shifters with an additional input because each chain that will be run in parallel will have a different phase shift to enable the steering beam. Let's see this in action. So this is the budget that we did right at the beginning. We're going to use the numbers in the last columns at the output of the budget. We're going to use the 3 dB of noise figure and the 44 dBm of output referred IP3. I created here an equivalent baseband model where we use the noise figure of um, uh, input referred, uh, the output IP3 uh, of the entire chain. We have a placeholder to represent the gain of the antenna block, a, a phase shifter for steering uh, the beam once we have multiple chains. Uh, we model the phase noise with the mixer and we have an S-parameter block that represents uh, uses a touchstone file uh, that we just created to represent the dispersion of our Butterworth filter as well as of our amplifier. 
I have here a separate um, script where we cascaded the S parameters of um, the dispersive components. So we have the S parameters of our filters, we have the S parameters of our curve amplifier, we cascade them, uh, we uh, computed the S parameters of the chain, and then we save them in this touchstone file. So we will take into account selectivity as well as ripple as well as phase dependency in bandwidth of each uh, of each of the bandwidth. We now run the simulation, we verify the output power or the power at each uh, stages of the chain. We look at the noise floor that is the same with our accurate model on the top and our idealized model on the bottom. We also verify the IP3. Now we verified that we could create a, an idealized baseband model at a higher degree of a higher level of abstraction. And keep in mind that this model doesn't provide exactly the same results, but provides results that are similar enough. Now we look at the coupling. We're going to mod model the coupling at the input and at the output. And this is an example. In your chain, you might have to break it in multiple places, depending on where the coupling actually happens. We're going to do this using coupling matrix. And we are going to create these coupling matrices by looking at the S parameters of the elements where coupling occurs. In this case, we model the insertion loss introduced by the Wilkinson splitter, and we're going to use uh, the impedance uh, mismatch losses on the diagonal of our matrix. On the off-diagonal elements, we're going to use uh, the S parameters of the diagonal to look at the isolation. We do this for the Wilkinson as well as for our antenna array. Uh, this is a simplified way to look at the effects of coupling as well as impedance mismatch losses. So we go back to our test bench here, uh, where we test our transmitter. Again, we hop through the first st uh, steps of the test bench quite rapidly, where we generate the waveform, we scale the input power. And here we are going to create our first coupling matrix. So remember, SW is the uh, S parameters of our Wilkinson. We use the elements on the diagonal to look at mismatch losses and off the diagonal to look at insertion losses and coupling effect. Uh, we multiply our input waveform, 5G standard compliant input waveform, times our coupling matrix. Now we're going to prepare the simulation for um, parallel simulation. So for each parallel simulation for each chain, we're going to create a two time series. The first time series represents the input signal. The second time series represents the phase shifts to control the phase shift so that we can steer the beam. And by the way, what are we going to use? Uh, we are going to simulate the model TX underscore 1, that is our idealized basement model that we just verified. Uh, we're going to use the PAR sim to run eight parallel simulations. And at the output, we are going to look at the output. You see, this is the output power of each of the eight chains. Each power is slightly different due to coupling. We're going to, to couple the outputs using the output coupling matrix that we just computed using the S parameters of the antenna array. And then we are going to combine the signals using an eight element ULA, uh, which uh, uses our patch uh, the, uh, antenna uh, pattern. We measure the output spectrum. You see the tapering uh, due to the S parameters. Uh, you see the spectral regrowth. We also measured standard compliant EVM using the 5G function. So, so far, what did I do? Well, actually, I repeated the same simulation that we did before because we already done the simulation brute force uh, by using the full uh, simulation of the entire array, including the S parameters of the Wilkinson splitter as well as the antenna array. In other words, I just validated that my behavioral model of the chain as well as a representative model of the coupling matrix is good enough. I compared the results. They are close. They are not exactly identical because the models are different. The model on the right has operates at a higher abstraction level. But this is good enough and it allows me to extend to 1024 antenna elements. So you can see here how I can quickly go from eight elements now to 1,024. You can see here on the left how we modify our script to around 1,024 antenna elements. And if you have a good computer with lots of cores, the simulation will be much faster. We use parsim to run the simulation. And actually, we use the infinite array patch um, 
approach to compute the pattern of the antenna uh, of the embedded element inside our antenna array. And then we combine the results. To look at the output power, we, of course, we always kept the same input power. So now the antenna array has a very, very high directivity. So actually, we are actually going to get a lot of power at the output. But we can now verify the spectrum as well as uh, the EVM. This approach, of course, is very flexible, but also requires you to have a good understanding of uh, where the coupling occurs, uh, where the dispersion occurs, and how to model it. Um, so what can we say at the end of this long day? We have seen a lot. Uh, but what we have seen is that at every single step, I verified using models uh, our simulation results. Designing millimeter wave systems is complex. It's physics. There is nothing that we can do with that. But we can use models to verify that uh, at every step, our abstraction level uh, can be uh, raised and can, uh, our model can be improved. Uh, so we understood coupling, dispersion, phase noise. We went beyond the textbook calculations and beyond the CW metrics by using um, standard compliant uh, waveforms to measure EVM and the CLR. We saw, for example, what happens where components deviate from the specification, and we gained insight into architectures and algorithms, for example, such as beamforming or, or uh, equalization, uh, before going to the lab. And of course, you can use such a model while you are in the lab to debug what's happening. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this uh, long presentation and that uh, you found it as entertaining as I did. Thank you.